Simon Taylor, thank you very much for being here with us at Sverig Business School for our uh, FinTech Future Series. Um, my first question to you is, uh, what according to you is the essence of blockchain? It's a very interesting question. I'm going to start by saying, what is the essence of Netflix? What is the essence of Amazon? What is the essence of the internet? If I asked you, how does the internet work? The answer is you probably don't care. You just care that it works. So what's really important to understand is what problem does the internet solve? The problem the internet solves is communicating at distance. The problem the blockchain technologies solve is knowing what has been communicated at distance. So the problem we have today in business, the big problem in business, is that I don't know what's inside your database. You don't know what's inside mine. I can send you a message. It's like calling you on the telephone saying, I think this is what I'm, I've got in my database. And you say, I think this is what I've got in my database. But we don't know. What a blockchain does is give me mathematical certainty that our records match. And you'd be surprised how much that fixes in the world of financial services, music, media, telecoms, government, and so on. When we talk about blockchain, uh, I'm under the impression that most people see blockchain as a technology to actually reduce costs <laughs> uh, or increase efficiency, but do you have some good examples of uh, how blockchain can be used to actually create new revenues or, or be uh, at the underpinning of new business models? So I think part of the reason people see it as a cost reducer is because banks have been the first to use the technology, and certainly banks in Europe are very, very cost conscious. So if you look at the economic environment that banks are in, they're very worried about cost. So the story about banks and blockchain is all about cost. But it's a technology. It isn't for cost reduction. It isn't for revenue generation. It isn't for customer satisfaction. It's a tool. And like any tool, you can use it to achieve any outcome. So the things that really excite me are the things that would be generating new revenue would be new opportunities. I get excited by new revenue generating opportunities in blockchain because I don't think people talk about them much. People talk about cost reduction because I think you can talk about that uh, in a non-competitive way very, very easily. Now, from what I've seen in the startup world, if you go down far enough, you'll see some really interesting things happening where people are talking about new asset classes where people are talking about new ways of solving problems and new ways of generating revenue from new financial contracts or from solving problems for young artists or for solving problems in governments but creating that as an opportunity for business. Those areas really do excite me. One of the things that fascinated me is blockchain seems to be this kind of new hip technology, huh? uh, the new kid around the block. Uh, and on the other hand, you have to combine this, uh, especially in financial services, with existing technology, <laughs> with legacy. So are we heading towards a period where these two have to be integrated and connected? How do you see that? That is one of the debates at the moment. Uh, there, you can almost see that if we're in a world where banks continue to hold onto their existing infrastructure, they're not going to turn their computers off overnight. They're not going to switch off all of their customers and migrate them. And other companies like Visa and MasterCard and Swift and so on, they're not going to remove their systems. So what we've got is those existing systems, and now we've got new systems alongside them. For a bank, in the short term, your cost has actually gone up because now I'm supporting more systems. So it begs the question, what is the business case? Is it cost reduction? Well, I can only reduce cost if I'm displacing the old. So surely the business case should be about revenue. The interoperability point is always hard in banking, always hard. But it's, oh, it's hard in any industry. The internet did it well. There have been one or two examples where interoperability has been done really well. But there are a lot of startups saying, well, hang on, we can solve a problem in banking today. We can get a business case where if we just have 12 banks in one country using our system, that business case stands up by itself. So we don't need to do anything else. We don't need to worry about having interoperability or anything. It just works discreetly. There will be integration and that will be costly, but overall, the business case makes sense. And I suspect what we'll see is more of these projects over the next three to five years that on their own make sense. And then eventually somebody will stand back and say, why are there so many of these projects and none of them talk to each other? 
and then standards will emerge. What is it, the coolest blockchain application you've seen last oh, year? The issue of digital identity, I think, is the problem in the world. Not just for business, but for uh, healthcare, for um, global development, for uh, er er eradicating poverty, for any of these things. So the really interesting thing about identity right now is the definition of your legal identity is when the government says, you're Bjorn, that's who you are. It's a government pointing at you. Why do I need that if I've got a blockchain? Because what a government does is it's an authority that says, this is really Bjorn. When you see this face and you see this passport number, this is the government saying you can trust this. Think about what a blockchain does. It proves something is really true with maths. If I can prove I really am who I say I am, do I need that anymore? P possibly not. But I'm probably not going to change that in a developed economy. Where that's really going to make a difference is with migrants. Where that's really going to make a difference with is people under the poverty line, people who really struggle for basic daily needs, for financial inclusion, that have uh, no digital inclusion, that may not exist. They're at risk of child slavery. They're at risk of being exploited. They're at risk of crime. Uh, they're at risk of disease. They're at risk of famine. Because we can't track and look after these people. And the reason we can't do that is because there isn't a digital identity system that could be brought in to be international before. Why? Because who governs that system? Who is the person that runs the digital identity system for the whole world? Nobody's going to agree. Is it going to be the UN? Well, we'd, we'd argue forever and ne never get it done. If I'm in control of my identity and I'm the only one that can operate on the blockchain as me by being me, that could be radical. Think about the costs of KYC, AML, and banking. Think about the difficulty, the amount of times you have to take a passport and a piece of paper somewhere to prove you are who you say you are. Now imagine eradicating all of that cost from industry and also solving all of those other problems. So I don't know if that one's cool, but it's really, really important. And for the cool things, how far out in the future are we with combining blockchain technology, IoT, um, these kind of technologies? As always, the answer is you can do it today. You can go work with Ethereum and IoT devices right now. Raspberry Pi and Ethereum um, together is probably one of the first projects you should be doing. Uh, the issue isn't, does the technology work? The issue is, is there a compelling customer proposition and can somebody execute on that customer proposition? But that's the issue outside of blockchain as well.